If you have your Bibles, you turn with me to Malachi chapter 2. I could listen to Steve. Steve's type person on a rainy day like today. He could just play all day and we'd enjoy it. What a gift God has given him. Malachi chapter 2. We appreciate uh, our sound and video people. Brian's been doing it a lot. Chris is learning. Um, and Randy. And we need more help. Uh, it would be great if we could get a team where they could rotate. And so uh, we appreciate Chris stepping up. But anybody else is interested, even if you could do one week out of the month, be willing to learn it, that would be a blessing to us. We're looking in Malachi. We're going to be in chapter 2 beginning in verse 10. You know, the Christian commentator Stephen R. Miller shares about the story of a woman named Mildred Parsons. Mildred Parsons was employed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the late 1900s up, well, mid to late 1900s up to the early 2000s. She retired in the summer of 2002 at the ripe old age of 88, and she still holds the distinction of being the longest serving employee of the FBI. But what was even more amazing about Mildred Parsons was this, and it really is unparalleled. Mildred Parsons worked for the FBI 62 years, nine months, and two days without ever missing a day she was scheduled to work. No sick days, no unexpected absences, no, no situations where she woke up in the morning and said, I really don't feel like going to work and doing that. No, no days where she said, I'd have a lot more fun doing something else. I could come up with an excuse in missing. She was faithful and she faithfully showed up every single day. You know, we're living in days today when a track record like that would be literally amazing. In fact, in 2017, it was said, and this was before the COVID pandemic, 40% of people left their job within 12 months of being employed. Um, you know, unless you've been hiding for the last few years, you understand about the work shortage. Uh, everywhere you see people looking for people uh, to work. But I have great admiration for people who work hard, who faithfully show up every day and do so not just today, but tomorrow and the next day and the next day and on and on. You know, faithfulness is truly a virtue. It's never something that we should take for granted. Our God is faithful to us, but it's very important for us to know today that God desires that we be faithful to him. And would it be that we would be a faithful people, that people could look at us, and more importantly, God could look at us when our life has been lived and would say, that woman, that man was faithful. Malachi is speaking uh, here in chapter 2 about faithfulness, or rather the lack of faithfulness of the people of Judah in his day. And I want you to look with me. I want to read in Malachi chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. He says, don't all of us have one father? Didn't one God create us? Why then do we act treacherously against one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has acted treacherously, and a detestable thing has been done in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's sanctuary, which he loves, and married the daughter of a foreign god. To the man who does this, may the Lord cut off any descendants from the tents of Jacob, even if they present an offering to the Lord of hosts. That means even if they're a leader. Verse 13, and this is another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer respects your offering or receives them gladly from your hands. Yet you ask for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, you've acted treacherously against her, though she was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. Didn't the one God make us with a remnant of his life breath? And what does the one seek? A godly offspring. So watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously against the wife of your youth. If one hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. Let's pray. Father, as we look at your word, 
Our prayer is that we would be faithful in every situation in our life, whether it be in the workplace, most certainly if we're part of a family, faithful in that, faithful to our spouses. And then, Lord, most importantly, faithful to you. We thank you for your word. Open our eyes to its truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we already know from our previous weeks of study that things were not great in Malachi's day. But the problem was not with God. Even though the people had a lot of questions, and we mentioned the number of questions that people asked God in uh, these four chapters of Malachi, even though they had lots of questions, it's very clear the problem was not with God. God had been faithful to his people. He had been faithful to his covenant. He had brought them through difficult times, and he had established them as a people after their exile in, ba in Babylon. The problem was not with God, but it was the people who came out of the exile. They were corrupt in their practices, we see. They, uh, they were deficient in how they carried out their offerings. They were ungrateful. They were offering just their leftovers and expecting God to be appreciative of it. But to make matters worse, they did not even realize their sin. It's so important in our lives that we're able to see ourselves as God sees us, not, not as we perceive ourselves. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand that. And so as we've really been looking, the people in Malachi's day, for, for them to be right with God, they first needed to see what they had done wrong. And there were many things. And so God is like a skilled surgeon. Like a skilled surgeon, God is working through Malachi to diagnose and to correct the problems that were existing among the people. And he didn't stop with what we've looked at the last couple of weeks. But we see today that as he begins to help them to see their deficiencies, and, and there's a difference between God and the devil. When the devil tries to bring out our deficiencies, he tries to beat us down. Whenever God brings to our attention our sin, something that's lacking or something that's not acceptable to God, the intent is always that we would repent and be right with God. And that was the purpose God had in Malachi's day. He, he desired that they would no longer spurn his love, but they would return that love. You see, the people, they were turning from their commitments to God, we see today. And not only that, they were betraying their marriage commitments. It was as if one thing was affecting the other, and certainly it was. They were chasing idolatrous and, and uh, forbidden women. God was not happy with them. You know, as we look at our text today, and you probably notice in the outline in your bulletin, there are really two points. It's not a three point today, but there are two real main points uh, that we want to look at today. And we're going to look at the vertical relationship and the horizontal relationship. Simply put, a vertical relationship is our relationship with God. Our horizontal relationship is our relationships with others. That might be in the church, in our family, in the workplace. And we see that God does not compartmentalize these two relationships, that they're interrelated. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, let's look at the greatest commandment that Jesus gave. He says, when, when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind, and strength. And another is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with your whole being vertical and love your neighbor, the horizontal relationships. What about John in 1 John chapter 4 in verse 20? He talks again about the interconnectedness of our vertical relationship with the Lord and our relationship with others. And he asks a rhetorical question that was really challenging the people in his day in the New Testament in the late first century. And so what he is saying is how can you say that you love God whom you've not seen when you hate or despise your brother whom you have seen? And so it's very clear, again, you, you can't separate the two. But let's look also at what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount. And in his Sermon on the Mount, he makes very clear how these two relationships are to be connected. He says if you're at the altar preparing to give your gift to God, 
the vertical relationship. And there you realize that your brother has something against you. And he didn't say that you have something against your brother. Your brother has something against you. There's a need to be reconciled. He said, first go and be reconciled and then come back and offer your gift. What he is saying is we can't compartmentalize. We can't say we're going to love God and we're going to serve God, yet not deal with these horizontal relationships. So as we look at it here today in Malachi's day, both relationships were wrong. And since their vertical relationship with God was not right and their horizontal relationship with one another was not right, it sort of follows that one led to the other. That it wasn't that each was separate, but they were in need of repentance in both of these areas. Well, I want to look at each of these two primary relationships. As we do it, I, I want to also do a self-evaluation as we look and and as we honestly say, God, where am I in my relationship with you, with my brothers and sisters in Christ? But first, I want you to note with me, the people of Judah were guilty of disregarding their covenant with God. They were guilty of that. God had established a covenant with his people. He established it with Abraham. And God was very heavy in that. And God carried the weight of that. But God expected his love to be returned. You know, the sin of idolatry toward God is compared to the sin of adultery among people. In idolatry, the person of God leaves that allegiance to God, that sole allegiance to God, and begins to give attention and allegiance and all of that to another. In the sin of adultery, the married person defies the bond of marriage and chases after another. And so before Judah was sent into exile in Babylon, years before we see these words that we read today, they were guilty of idolatry. And God described it like human adultery because he said in Jeremiah 3.20, as a woman may betray her lover, so you have betrayed me, house of Israel. Now, let's think for a moment to this point in history, what God had done for the people of Israel. He called Abraham when he was Abram. He called Abram out of a pagan people. Abram was not a person, and God made him a person, and God blessed him, and he gave him a covenant. He reaffirmed that covenant through Jacob. And through Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, uh, that covenant was kept. He delivered the people from slavery in Egypt, but also at this point we see he had delivered them from exile in Babylon after he had established the covenant with King David. And so God is faithful to his promise. He made a people who were not a people, a people. And then he made a promise and he kept it. He gave them commands that they might know how to live. He established the way for his people to relate to him. He established a system of sacrifice and priests who would be uh, mediators of that as that offering was made to God. He gave instruction. He gave direction through the judges and through the prophets. And so God, as the covenant keeper, could stand at that point in history and say, I established you as a people when you're not. I kept that line true. I've delivered you twice from significant times of bondage. I've established you. I've given you ways to communicate with me. I've communicated with you through the prophets. I've delivered you in the time of the judges and he did all of that yet here in Malachi chapter 2 his people had a wandering eye and wayward feet God says in verse 11 Judah has acted treacherously and a detestable act has been done in Israel and and, and in Jerusalem the idea of treacherous speaks to a failure to keep one's word to keep one's part of this commitment or to fulfill one's obligations. You see, Judah had compartmentalized God. And we talk about Sunday Christians. These individuals, they were Sabbath believers and sacrificial day actors. 
They did not have a heart for God, nor were they faithful to God during the week. But when it came time to do the religious act, they went through the motions of it. I've shared before, when I was young, I lived very close to the church that I attended, which meant when we had guest ministers, and we're going to have a great guest minister next week, but whenever our church had guest ministers, most of the time, my parents hosted on Sunday. I, I liked seeing people come to the house, but there was a real drawback to it. It meant I was only going to get a drumstick or a wing. And it meant also that I was not a dignitary, and so I had to hide in the back of the house. Now, young people, there are not many in here. I want you to know when we grew up, we were lucky if we got the leftovers. Now we almost let the kids go first. That's, a, that's beside the point. <laughs> but I can remember when all of the adults finished, I could come in, and I might be able to get a drumstick, and it might still be warm, might still be warm. I was a child. I understood that. If we give a child everything when they're young, what do they have to look forward to when they get older? I understand that. But Judah was treating God that way. They were prioritizing their idols. And then when the idols had sort of moved on, then they would bring God in and give him the leftovers. That's why God is saying, why are you profaning the sanctuary which I love. He says, you've profaned it and you've married the daughter, the end of verse 11, of a foreign God. That's their adultery. They were guilty of spiritual adultery. They were making a mockery of God. They gave an outward appearance that they were faithful to the one to whom they were betrothed, yet they were on the side and even openly uh, serving idols and then thinking that they could just come back and carry on with God as if it never happened. And God said, you're profaning my sanctuary. What does God think of such religious compartmentalism? What does he think when we speak of God in our talk, but our lives do not match the commitment? We see the answer in verse 12. He said to the man who does this, may the Lord cut off any of his descendants. That means he would be broken from the fellowship and the privileges of the tents of Jacob, even if they present an offering of the Lord of hosts. In other words, even if you were a dignitary, even if you were a priest, you're not going to be treated special if you're guilty of this. What's the application for us today? If we're honest with ourselves, is our sole allegiance to God. Are we live in our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ and his glory. I don't know about you, but many times in my life, my priorities can get out of whack, can be displaced. But again, as we look at God's desire and drawing to our attention when our allegiance moves in a wrong direction, God's desire is what? That we repent, that we confess and repent and come back into that faithfulness toward God. And so we see the people of Judah, Judah were guilty uh, in their relationship with God. But I want you to see a second thing. The people of, of Judah were guilty of disregarding their marriage commitments. You know, there's something that's true about personal sin often, and it's this. It has a contaminating effect. One person's sin can many times affect many people, sometimes a few people, sometimes many. Uh, someone can, a child can become guilty of breaking the law, and that parent the grandparent is affected by that. It could be that a spouse just abandons a wife or a husband and takes off and live his or her own way and their children that are left to pick up on that. I could continue with a number of things, but you get the point. And that was the effect in Malachi's day. It was that the sin had a contaminating Effect. Look at verse 10. Don't all of us have one father? Didn't one God create us? He was speaking of the unity of the body. But the sin was fragmenting it. Why then do we act treacherously against one another? That horizontal relationship profaning the covenant 
of our fathers. In other words, the unfaithful ones, the ones that God was addressing through Malachi, they were pulling down the group. It was affecting the nation. We've already seen they were unfaithful toward God, but it didn't stop there. They were unfaithful to each other. And specifically, they were unfaithful. That is, many of them were unfaithful to their spouses. They trivialized the marriage covenant. They trivialized the institution of marriage. There were those who were divorcing their spouses, and God is using that word again in verse 14, that word treacherous, that they were dealing treacherously, acted treacherously, these men were, toward their wives. They disregarded their marriage vows. They abandoned them in their commitment to them. And verse 14 lets us know that God was watching that God was observing what was going on. Very importantly, God created the institution of marriage and he honors what he has created. Look at me now. Marriage is between one man and one woman. That is God's definition. I don't care what anyone else says. Marriage is one man to one woman. You go back in Genesis 2. Man shall leave his father and mother and cleave not to multiple women, but to cleave unto his wife. Not to cleave unto a man, but to cleave the man is to a woman. We need to be very aware today that the world is sending a message that directly contradicts and conflicts with the truth of God. You say, well, I have a right to do what I want. Well, you might have a right, but you also have a right to suffer the consequences of that. You say, well, why is it important that the church stand for biblical marriage? We already see it in verse 10. When we give ground and we don't uphold the standard, it doesn't just affect one person, it affects all of society. I want you to think of this illustration for a moment. Imagine for a moment that you had a beautiful painting in your home. It was very precious to you. you, you uh, the frame every day was being dusted. You made sure that you had the perfect glass to protect that. And, and as I was visiting with you, you drew to my attention, not only is it valuable to you, but you actually were the artist. Imagine after hearing that, I said, I, I really don't like that. I'm gonna take uh, the glass off. I'm going to take my magic marker and I'm going to color this and I'm going to color that and I'm going to put it back up. Now, I'll tell you this, you might get hit. It is arrogant, it is disrespectful, and it is an infringement on the person who created that artwork. Marriage is created by God. He defined what marriage is. And we must stand on that truth. No matter what pressure society will place on us, everybody is concerned about offending someone else. You know the problem? We're not concerned with offending God. It doesn't bother people today. And that's a problem. That's a big problem. Because if we get that vertical relationship right, then the horizontal Seek ye first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. The problem is we're trying to appease people and all of the time we're appeasing people and guess what? They didn't create the institution. Those in Malachi's day trivialized marriage. They defined its value. They said it's not that important. They were selfish. People, we can't redefine it. And I'm going to tell you today, if you're born a female, you're a female. If you're born a male, you're a male. That is the way it is. That's the artwork. That's God's artwork. It's not to be changed. To be changed and to convince someone to do that is to lead that person down a wrong path. We must hold it. Marriage is God's sole ordained institution for one man and one woman 
to express sexual love for each other, to mutually complete one another, to propagate the faith through the birth of godly children. That's what verse 15 says, that last part, the birth of godly children. Notice what he says, didn't God make us with a, a, a remnant of his life breath? And what does the one seek? A godly offspring. So watch yourself carefully and don't act treacherously. In other words, we as families, parents, grandparents, our responsibility is to, to facilitate the godly growth of children. And as Christians, we need to hold up God's standard of marriage. He says the wives of the youth are spouses of youth, the wives of the covenant. Now, let me make this very clear. I understand that divorce affects the church in many ways, all right? Divorce is not an unforgivable sin, all right? I had an elderly man one time, he, he, he's gone on uh, to be with the Lord. He was really concerned. He had gone through a divorce when he was young. He felt bad. He was married in, in a relationship then. I said, you need to be faithful in the relationship that you're in. Going back now, God wants you to be faithful where you are, all right? The Bible never commands divorce, but it does give concession for it, the abandonment by a spouse. If a spouse abandons, I don't think you can rope and tie and bring them back. And then marital unfaithfulness, sexual immorality, are two reasons clear the Bible gives um, as grounds for divorce. But we need to understand in our weakness, we must still hold up God's standard. We must still hold that standard that God loves marriage. Are you married now? Stay strong in that marriage. Pray for your spouse. Love that spouse. Be everything. Watch God bless you in it. Well, God makes it clear Judah had been unfaithful. Unfaithful to him. Unfaithful toward each other. Living for themselves. What were they to do? Well, we see one thing that didn't move the the meter with God. Look at, at verse 13. And this is another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer respects your offering or receives them gladly from your hands. They did not need emotion or tears. They needed resolve. I, I tend to believe as I study this text that their grief was still not a godly grief. They were just concerned because they were living their lives the way they wanted to and God wasn't accepting them the way they wanted to live. So all the tears, they could cry a river. It wasn't moving the meter with God. God expected resolve, repent, repent from their idolatry, reaffirm their allegiance, reaffirm the Lordship of God. Repent from selfishness that was affecting the marriages and manifested and putting off marriages. Repent of lives that are displeasing to God. And whenever we find ourselves in a position of unfaithfulness, there's an answer. Repent and believe. Repent. Repent. Resolve. God, I'm not where I need to be. God, help me. God, I need your grace and your mercy. I'm thankful for the faithfulness of God. Do you realize God is faithful? We preach a message of grace. Aren't you glad we don't preach a message of the law? We, we, we preach the law. We preach about the law. But salvation is through grace. I heard one person say, I can't remember his name. I share it with Karen. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. In other words... If, if Satan starts to beat you up, just take that look at Christ and say, God, forgive me. I repent. Lord, lead me to a closer walk with you. Would it be that we'd be found faithful? Let's pray. Father, as we have looked at your word today, I pray you would speak your truth into our hearts. That, Father, our lives can make a difference for good or for bad. That, Lord, when we adjust our lives to your truth in our human relationships, in our relationship with you, Lord, we're blessed. And not just us, but others. So, Father, open our eyes as we have time to respond this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is going to be...